From Washington, D.C., this is the Muslim News on Muslim Network TV. Assalamu alaikum, I'm Hannah Zuberi. Our top story tonight, former U.S. President Donald Trump may face a third indictment. This time, it is for attempting to overturn the results of the 2020 presidential election. Trump says he received a letter from the Justice Department officials ordering him to face a grand jury investigating the January 6, 2021 Capitol riots. The ex-president has been indicted on two counts so far. One is for hush money payments to Stormy Daniels. The other is for allegedly mishandling of classified documents. Trump has denied wrongdoing in both cases, claiming they were part of a political campaign against him. Last week, his lawyers requested the proceedings be delayed until after the 2024 election. Georgia state prosecutors are also expected to announce a decision on whether to file charges against Trump for, to nullify Georgia's 2020 election results. The grand jury will ultimately decide whether to indict him. The panel was sworn in last week in Atlanta. Prosecutors say a decision could come in August. From north to south, the United States is struggling with extreme climate change conditions. Parts of the northern United States are experiencing poor air quality caused by smoke from Canadian wildfires. These wildfires have reached Washington State, Northern California, and Oregon, as well as parts of Michigan and Wyoming. Meanwhile, southern states such as Arizona and Texas are struggling with extreme heat. According to the National Weather Service, temperatures are rising steadily in Arizona and Texas, as well as California and Nevada. In some parts of California, the temperatures reach a whopping 129 degrees Fahrenheit. Las Vegas recorded over 116 degrees Fahrenheit, while residents of Arizona and Texas continue to struggle with temperatures around 104 degrees. U.S. climate change envoy John Kerry says cooperation with China is necessary to address the world's climate crisis. Kerry met for about four hours with his Chinese counterpart, Xi Jinhua, in Beijing. Kerry says the world's two largest economies must work together to limit global warming. He's calling for an urgent action on a number of fronts, specifically on the challenge of coal and methane pollution. The two countries have resumed talks on combating climate change after almost a year-long hiatus. They suspended climate talks after the then U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan last August. Analysts say Washington is trying to stabilize relations with Beijing, particularly on climate change, despite China's strong reaction to Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. Florida Republican Governor Ron DeSantis has vowed to cut funding to the United Nations agencies that, quote, target Israel. Speaking at the Christians United for Israel Summit in Virginia, the 2024 Republican presidential candidate says that the U.S. will not provide funding to the U.N. if it targets Israel. DeSantis specifically named the UN Human Rights Council for consistently targeting Israel. He claims that by targeting Israel, they promote anti-Semitism. DeSantis also says that the West Bank is not occupied territory, but quote, disputed territory, and that Israel has the largest claim to that land. The U.S. Senate is gearing up for a crucial debate on the future of Guantanamo Bay, the notorious U.S. military prison in Cuba. It will be part of a discussion about the Annual National Defense Authorization Act, or NDAA. The prison was established during the War on Terror in 2002 within the naval base 
off the coast of Guantanamo Bay. The facility has been criticized for the use of torture and other forms of abuse. A New York Times estimate from last year says it currently holds 30 detainees. Over the past two decades, nine people have died while in custody, while over 700 others have been transferred out. In 2006, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled detainees were entitled to minimal protections under the Geneva Conventions. Lawmakers from both sides of the aisle have argued that the facility is necessary, while others have demanded its closure. Ex-President Donald Trump signed an executive order keeping the facility open indefinitely. The NDAA is likely to include language prohibiting the use of funds to close Guantanamo Bay. President Joe Biden's administration opposes this, but it, it is unclear if it will be able to overcome the opposition in Congress. The cost of maintaining Guantanamo Bay is estimated to be $540 million per year. A U.S. congressman has proposed exchanging Pakistani prisoner Afia Siddiqui for Shaquille Afridi. Congressman Brad Sherman says Afridi deserves to be released as he was a key member of the U.S. team that killed Osama bin Laden. Afridi is a Pakistani doctor who helped the CIA run a fake vaccination campaign to track down bin Laden. He was sentenced to 33 years in prison in Pakistan but his sentence was later reduced to 10 years. Sherman says Afridi risked his life to help the U.S. capture, quote, the world's most wanted terrorist. Afia Siddiqui is serving an 86-year sentence in Texas for the attempted murder of a U.S. soldier in Afghanistan. Her defense team denies this accusation. The Pakistani citizen who graduated from Brandeis University in the United States disappeared in Pakistan in 2004, along with her three young children. In 2010, she was sentenced to prison by a U.S. court. Last month, she was allowed to meet her sister Fawzia Siddiqui after nearly 20 years. After drought, rain brings devastation to Somalia. Story comes with details after the break. Stay tuned and we will be right back. Welcome back. Somalia, which has been plagued by extreme drought for 40 years, is now struggling with rain and flooding. The United Nations has called for urgent humanitarian action to help the East African nation. The drought has killed 40,000 people in the country. Now floods have displaced thousands and destroyed what crops remained in the fields. Reports say that there's acute food shortages in the affected areas. Flooding so far has displayed 25,000 people near the capital, Mogadishu. The UN official for coordination of humanitarian affairs reports a little over 30% of funding has been allocated for aid delivery this year. According to the agency, more than $2 billion is needed to meet the needs of over 7 million Somalis. The situation in the Horn of Africa country will continue to deteriorate if emergency aid does not reach those in need. Dozens of Rohingya refugees were injured in Indian-administered Jammu and Kashmir after police used tear gas at a detention center. The refugees were protesting their detention and demanding release or deportation. Relatives who were outside the detention center demanded that they also be detained with their families. The Indian government considers Rohingya to be illegal immigrants and a security threat. Tear gas was used to break up a protest by the refugees who were on hunger strike. Videos of the attack shows a group of refugees being surrounded by police and tear gas being thrown into their midst. 
Police authorities have not commented on the incident. Amnesty International reports more than 750,000 Rohingya refugees, mostly women and children, have fled Burma for Bangladesh. They left after the Burmese military launched a genocide of their community in August 2017. While over a million are in Bangladesh, many reached India as well. Iran's morality police have resumed patrols to enforce the country's dress code. The dress code requires women to cover their bodies and wear a headscarf. State-run Force News Agency reports patrols to monitor compliance are being carried out nationwide. The morality policy has been withdrawn following nationwide demonstrations in September 2022. This was in response to the death of a 22-year-old woman in police custody. She was arrested by the morality police for not wearing a headscarf. More than 200 people, including security forces, were killed in the month-long unrest. Human rights groups estimate the number of more than 500 people. Seven people were executed for their involvement in the protests. Many more remain on death row, despite repeated calls for a pause. The United Nations Security Council for the first time has addressed the global implications of artificial intelligence. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres warned AI has the potential to cause horrific levels of death and destruction. He says it could enable a new level of authoritarian surveillance. Guterres also notes that AI could contribute between 10 to 15 trillion dollars to the global economy by 2030. He welcomed calls by some member states for the creation of a new UN body to support collaborative efforts to master AI technology. British Foreign Secretary James Cleverly called for the global governance of AI. He announced the UK plans to bring world leaders together this fall for the first major global summit on AI security. Two Palestinians were injured and 25 others detained in Israeli military raids Monday in the occupied West Bank. According to a local NGO, one Palestinian was injured by live fire when Israeli forces raided the Fawar refugee camp south of Hebron. Palestinian Prisoner Society spokesman Amjad al-Najjar says another person was wounded in an Israeli raid in the Aqabat Jabr camp in Jericho City. Israeli forces have also detained 25 Palestinians, including 16 in Hebron. Other arrests took place in Bethlehem, Ramallah, Nablus, Jericho, Jerusalem and Jenin. Tensions have been running high across the occupied West Bank in recent months. Nearly 195 Palestinians have been killed by Israeli forces since the start of the year. At least 27 Israelis have also been killed in separate attacks during the same period. Muslim groups in Finland are calling for the government to take concrete steps to achieve quote, zero tolerance on racism. A statement signed by 26 Islamic communities and groups evoked Finland's Freedom of Religion Act. The law states everyone has the right to practice their own religion. The statement calls on the Finnish government and Prime Minister Petteri Orpo to condemn the normalization of hate speech and rooting out racist ideas. It also stresses that this includes the freedom to dress according to one's religion. The groups were incensed after Deputy Prime Minister Riekia Pura, who criticized Muslim women's dress, did not apologize for her remarks. She criticized Muslim women's clothing in a blog in 2019. Muslim groups called her remarks racist, degrading, and discriminatory in tone. The covering of the holiest Muslim site, the Kaaba, in Mecca, was changed Wednesday in an elaborate annual ceremony. The ritual coincides with the first day of the Islamic calendar, 
The new Muslim year, Hijri 1445, began Wednesday in the Middle East and in many parts of the world. The Saudi press agency says 130 technicians and manufacturers were involved in the elaborate 10-step process of replacing the old cloth with a new one. The handmade cloth is called kiswa in Arabic. It's made from raw silk, as well as gold and silver wires. The raw material was processed in an assembly line with the largest sewing machine in the world. Parts of the black dyed silk fabric were embroidered by hand with verses from the Quran using solid gold wire. Before we end today's news, may I make a special request? It takes 55 hours of work daily to produce this news for you. It's news with a unique perspective, and you find it only here. Sound Vision is a not profit organization which produces it. And just like PBS and NPR, it depends on your donations. Please visit Muslim Network TV to donate now. Or click the link below to donate. That's all from our Washington DC studios tonight. Thank you for tuning in. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel or hit the bell icon for the latest updates. For more content, keep watching Muslim Network TV or visit muslimnetwork.tv. Assalamu alaikum and good night.